introduce you to our keynote speaker of the day, Mr. Jaime Gilinski, one of the most representative leaders in Colombia's private sector and an established investor and philanthropist. The conference topic, Colombia 2040, is a great opportunity to learn from Mr. Gilinski. Years ago, 40 years ago, he finished his MBA at Harvard Business School and returned to Colombia. And he has led and seen with his own eyes the transformation that the country has had in the last years. And it's a great opportunity to learn from those lessons in the next years to Colombia 2040. Let me give you some examples of the impact that he has had in the country and actually in the world. Um, when he returned to Colombia 40 years ago, he led a company of 160 employees. Today, he runs a conglomerate of 45,000 employees. Second example, he's the only Colombian in the board of Harvard Business School in history. He's the only Colombian in the board of Georgia Tech in history, and his involvement in the education sector is significant, very significant. The third example, as a philanthropist, he has been working through the, his, his family's foundation um, in education and health topics. I want just to give, to give you one example of the work that they have been doing uh, on health. They are working with the Mount Sinai Hospital in Cartagena, and they were able to reduce in five years infant mortality because of lack of, uh, of, lack of access to medical equipment and good medical care um, by pregnant women. Just in five years, with some investment, bringing good doctors, bringing good equipment, they were able to drop the infant mortality rate from 1.1% to 0%. This kind of work is the thing that we want everybody in this conference to learn from, and we have lessons to hear from him and to just lead the transformation of the, of the country in the next 20 years. Please join me welcoming Mr. Jaime Hilinski. Muchas gracias. Eh, es para mí un honor y un gran placer estar eh, aquí con ustedes. Hace 40 años eh, llegué a Boston a estudiar a Harvard Business School. Y la verdad que Colombia y el mundo ha, ha cambiado mucho desde esa época. Y es interesante tener la oportunidad hoy de compartir con ustedes algo de, de la historia y también algo de, de lo que yo veo hacia el futuro. Había escrito la presentación en inglés, así que voy a tratar de hacerlo en inglés para no estar traduciendo y de pronto equivocándome. Y, y lo que son preguntas y respuestas las hacemos en español. Um, just to give you some background, as, as was said, I went to Georgia Tech, graduated in 1978 in industrial engineering, and graduated at the Harvard Business School in 1980 when I was just 22. In 1980, Colombia's GDP per capita was $1,204. The population was close to 28 million people, and the unemployment rate was 8.4%. Just to give you an idea, today, 2017, Colombia's GDP is $6,238. The population is close to 50 million people, and the unemployment rate is 9.3%. My, my dream when I returned to Colombia in 1981 was to really start building and starting companies that were efficient and that would create good for society and would become great uh, companies in the country. My first experience was the creation of JUPI, the snack companies that many of you know since you were kids in Colombia. I brought the first machine in 1980, and, and today the company is almost 38 years of age. At the same time, I wanted to create, as was mentioned before, it was a small company that my family had. I wanted to create a concept of building joint ventures uh, with major multinational companies that at the time, the beginning of the 80s, were looking at Colombia as a place to come in to invest and be part of the, what was called at that time, the Andean markets, Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia. I was able in the 1980s 
to convince Procter & Gamble, one of the largest companies in the world, and one of the top consumer companies in the world, to buy with us a company in Medellin called Inextra, which was the third market share leader in detergents in Colombia. And I can proudly say that today Procter & Gamble Colombia is probably the largest consumer products company in the country. At the same time, Cooper Industries of Houston became our joint venture partner at Empresa Andina de Herramientas in Cali and became the largest hand tool company in the Andean region at the end of 1989. In the beginning of the 90s, Colombia was a complicated country to be a banker, to own a bank, or to run a bank. The crisis of 1982 had affected, and about 78% of the Colombian banking system had been nationalized in the 1980s. In 1991, I had the chance to buy BCCI, part of a group, the international group that went bankrupt around the world. And our bank in Colombia was the only bank out of 137 countries that was saved. We renamed the bank Banco Andino in 1991, put a very strong management team, probably some of the top bankers in Colombia, and we took a bank that was losing in 1991 about one and a half million dollars a month, had a negative equity, had lost about 80% of the deposits since the crisis, and we were able to change the strategy, focalize on building a bank that was more efficient, concentrate on a corporate market, build ROE to close to 24%, and be able to really recapitalize the bank and become the seventh most efficient bank out of 28 in Colombia in three years. That was the passport that allowed me to acquire Banco de Colombia. Banco de Colombia was the largest bank in Colombia in 1993. It was the bank that the government decided to privatize and I, there was really no reason for me to buy it. I didn't have the money, I didn't have the capacity to run it, but I had the, the guts. And uh, I was able to convince 87 major institutional investors around the world, among them is George Soros, who together we invested and bought a bank in 1994 for a value of $500 million and most of my investment were loans. I came into a bank with a 1% return on equity, a bank that had about 15,000 employees in different businesses, some of them core banking and some of them none. And with the same strategy as in the first bank, having a very strong professional management team, we were able to build a bank and we became in 1996 the first bank in Colombia to have an investment grade by Moody's and by Standards & Poor's. In 1997, when the Spanish banks were coming to Colombia, we decided to merge with Banco Industrial Colombiano, the seventh largest bank at the time in the country, to make what is today called Bank Colombia, the largest bank in Colombia, and uh, the largest Colombian company, the New York, Stock, New York Stock Exchange. I left Colombia after the sale, and dedicated to try to look for new opportunities. And that's when I came in 2003 to the opportunity to buy the third bank in Colombia. That was the Sudameris Group, which was being sold by the largest banking group in Italy, in Tesla. It was a bank that had gone through a big crisis until, 19, until, uh, 19, uh, until 2003 that we purchased it. The bank had $400 million of assets, had about 28 branches, had lost about $100 million in the four years previous to the acquisition. And we came in for the third time, and I did it again. We took a bank with 0.4% market share in Colombia, a bank that had a solid base, but had no direction. And we had to do again the same thing, to clear a strategy, to devise a management team that was able to make this bank better. And I can proudly say that that bank that had $400 million in 2003 has $11.5 billion today. We have been able to grow market share from 0.4% to close to 4% of the Colombian financial system. We have been able in the last 15 years to build a bank that had a 7% NPL, those are loans into troubles, 
uh, ratio to have 1.1% December of last year, the lowest of any Colombian bank, with an average today in the Colombian banking system in December of 4.4. So almost, you know, 25% of that number. I think we have done that in banking with a very clear strategy and vision of trying to build companies that are efficient. I think that that's what I learned here at Harvard Business School. And I think that a leader in any company has to have that vision to be able to build companies not only successful and profitable, but to be good citizens and to really create value for society. I continue doing that and in 2012, we were able to acquire the operations of HSBC in Latin America, Colombia, Peru, and Paraguay. We are the only Colombian bank today to be in South America. And again, we did it the same. In 2013, when we bought the bank in Peru, the bank was losing $24 million, had about 1,050 employees and 24 branches, and was probably the number 13 out of 16 banks in Peru. I can proudly say that today we are the only Colombian bank in Peru. We are the number ninth bank in the country. This year profits will be in excess of $25 million. And we, ha we have been able to transform what was a money losing operation into a successful uh, enterprise in Peru. We did the same thing in Paraguay. We bought a bank in Paraguay in 2013 from HSBC with $2.2 million of profits, 5% return on equity. Equity was $50 million. And the equity at the end of March of this year ended up close to $142 million. We have an ROE of 22%, efficiency ratios of 41%, and we are considered today in the Paraguayan banking market the number one bank in terms of efficiencies. I think as a Colombian, I'm proud to say that we have been able to transform financial institutions in other countries in Latin America with the hard work, with the capacity of our Colombian team, and with the expertise that we have built in the last 15 years building this bank from 400 million to close to $12 billion now. In addition to that, we continue doing different things in the region. We have been able to expand into other countries in Panama, I came into an important joint venture with the acquisition and the privatization of the old Howard Air Force Base. Just 10 years ago, in 2007, 11 years ago, the government of Panama was privatizing a very large uh, uh, Air Force Base. We acquired the base uh, in partnership with a large uh, English property company. They had the expertise, had the local connections, and we have been able to transform that base into what today is one of the most important real estate projects in the world. I can proudly say that today there's 15,000 people working in the base. There's over 300 companies, major multinational companies such as Dell, 3M, some of the other companies of the world operating there. We have built close to 2,000 homes and we are in the process of building 35,000 homes in a 40 year period. That has transformed not only the base, but it really has become an example of how in 10 years you can really transform what you see as an opportunity into what it's today a reality that generates not only employment, but really uh, the improvement of the society in Panama. In 2013, I had the chance to do the same thing in Spain, became the largest shareholder of Banco Sabadell, the fourth largest bank in Spain. And doing that in 2013, when the crisis was hitting Spain, was not easy. But I felt like I have felt on all the opportunities, and I think the conference is about leadership, the desire to succeed and to, and to do things better. And I think that worked out well. I have to say that it's not only businesses. I think that the leaders in the world and all of you, men and women of all the universities that are here, for sure will be in 20 or 30 or 10 years, the leaders of Colombia. I was here at Harvard Business School with Presidente Juan Manuel Santos in 1979. He was at the Kennedy School. So I can really testify that a lot of you, one day will be presidents, ministers, and you know, leaders, CEOs, directors of universities, of hospitals, of the best places in Colombia, 
And I think we all have that duty and responsibility to go back and to help. As was mentioned before, not only business, but we have contributed to Colombia and support health and education with a variety of fellowships and scholarships for Colombian students in different universities in the United States. Our project in Cartagena, which is helping today 10,000 children that are born in Cartagena, there's 20,000 boys and girls that are born a year, so 50% of the kids in Cartagena are being serviced by this hospital. Machinery was brought, doctors were trained both in Colombia and in the U.S. And I think that we can proudly say that that effort has not only transformed the health of very poor people in Cartagena, but it has allowed women who, during the time of pregnancy six years ago, only 40% of women, of these 10,000 women, were having a, C, were having a, a sonogram in the nine months of the pregnancy. A woman requires to have three sonograms in the process, and we can proudly say that last year, all these 10,000 women had three sonograms, and I think that the success of the program reflects in the numbers. Just reflecting on what is leadership. Leadership for me is hard work. There's no question that there's nothing that replaces hard work. And I will always say, and in addition to that, a lot of more hard work. I think you have to dream. I have been a dreamer, I have dreamed all my life of doing different things, both business and personal. But I think that you have to have clear focus and clear objectives, and you really have to dedicate to whatever you do, whatever careers you choose, whatever future uh, uh, the future brings, you should do it and do it always with a lot of ganas, como decimos en español. You have to have flexibility, but you have to be able to make decisions. You have to be able, if you are running companies, to run them efficiently, to run them lean. And you have to compare yourself not only to your competitor locally, but to your competitor globally. And I think that's one of the messages that I will bring now for the Colombia of 2040, that we as Colombians have to look at the world as our competitive turf, not only as Colombia as our competitive turf. I think that we have always have to maintain optimism. Even in the hardest moment, optimism is the only thing that drives us and keeps us strong. We all will have hard moments. I have had many, many of those. And I still have many of those. But we have to keep optimism and we have to work hard. And whatever we do, we have to enjoy what we do. We have to do it with love. We have to dream big. We have to think big. We have to have a lot of luck. I think luck is something that comes from upstairs and we need it, all of us need it. But hard work and a lot of dreaming with a lot of luck can make it work. When we talk about Colombia, which I think was the subject of the, of the, of the conference, I said, how can I use my experience of 40 years, when I came to Colombia 40 years, 38 years ago, to really reflect in Colombia in 2040, which will be 22 years from now, it's much less than the time that I have been working in Colombia. What do we need to change? What do we need to improve? And how can we, each one of us, put a grain of stone into making that building stronger, which is the building of Colombia? Colombia is not a high-income GDP capita country today. It's considered by the World Bank and by the big institutions 12,236 GDP per capita, the number to be what they call a high-income country. We in Colombia are about, you know, 50% of that. From 1967 to 2017, the contribution of employment and productivity to the GDP of Colombia was 28% productivity and 72% was employment. In countries in Asia, in the same period, the productivity was 67% and employment was 33%. So I think there's a fundamental number that countries that have performed successfully in the last 10, 20, 30 years have demonstrated that productivity is a major requirement for countries and for societies to succeed. What do we need in Colombia today in 2018? 
I don't like to talk of politics. Politics are today, they will be tomorrow, and they will be in 2040. But we need to give Colombia the confidence to continue for business people, for entrepreneurs, for students as you, for graduates as you, to go back and to have the confidence to grow and to invest in Colombia. We need to accelerate productivity and we need to accelerate employment because the next 22 years or the next 40 years will be hard. And we need to support and create entrepreneurship. I have basically nine pillars. Every person in this conference has five pillars, four pillars, eight pillars. I have nine which I have written as things that I believe are important for Colombia. I'm sure that in the conference yesterday, many of the speakers have touched on some of them, and I'm sure that today too. But I think a country like Colombia, if I look at Colombia in 2040, needs the following things. We need first, and not in order of priority. I think all of them are extremely important. We need to improve productivity and generate good and sustainable employment for our Colombian people. We need to improve infrastructure and logistics to become competitive, not only in South America, in the world. We need to lower energy costs to companies so that they can be world competitive and be able to supply the world with products at competitive levels. We need to accelerate innovation and technology. When we are here in the United States, seeing what has happened in Silicon Valley and seeing the development of companies built by students such as you who suddenly have built some of these amazing companies in the country, I think that there is no reason why we as Colombians cannot have a great technology and innovation platform. I think we need to lower taxes. Colombia's taxes are too high. There's no reason why American companies are paying today 20% and Colombian companies are paying co close to 40%. In order to be world competitive, which I always define as the way that countries and companies have to define themselves, we need to allow companies and business to grow and prosper, to become stronger regionally and globally by having efficient cost structures. We have to have a very strong judicial system, zero corruption. There's no chance for corruption. I think that corruption has affected our economies. I today have banks in Peru, have banks in Colombia, and you don't imagine what we have suffered in each of the countries because of corruption and because of all the problems that the countries have had, and that's why their GDPs haven't grown, and then the countries don't grow. We need to improve education, and I have to put this one maybe on the first on the list. Improve education and health to the overall population. I'm trying to do it in my small way with our philanthropy, but I think as a country policy, education, as was mentioned in the previous conference, should be the key so that many students like you and many that are not here that cannot have the chance to be in a U.S. university like many of you have can have the chance to succeed in life like you will have and like I did. We need to strengthen and support the micro, the small and the medium-sized companies. In Colombia, as in the United States, the small companies and the medium companies are the ones that generate jobs, that generate growth. I think the number in Colombia, about 80% of our small and medium-sized companies are the ones that generate you know, the growth of the country. And the most important thing for those who will be in government, we need to maintain not only honest, but efficient governments. Where are we going to be in 2040? I think the world will be a diff different world. According to McKinsey, there are four basic things that will happen in the world in the next 30 years. One, there's an industrialization and urbanization of emerging economies, such as Colombia. In Colombia, we can see that the population has moved from the rural areas to the urban areas, as once mentioned before by Simon Gaviri in the previous conference. In 1980, when I was here at Harvard Business School, 38% of Colombian population was living in the rural areas. In 2015, 24% of the population are living now in the rural areas. Everybody has moved to the big cities. We're living in a world where disruptive technologies will change the world. We have now mobile phones, we have internet, genomics, robotics, changes in different energy sources, which will change the world, not only of today, but the world of the next 18 years. We have an, a population in the world that is getting older. I'm 60 now. I never thought I was going to be 60, and I don't feel old, 
But by 2040, those over 60 will be 20% of the global population, and one of every four persons will be 65 or older. That is a complete change to where the world has lived in the past. And last but not least, we are living in a globalized world of connections that are global and not anymore regional or local, like when I went to Colombia in 1980. Today, the world is a world in which we are seeing a totally new consumer class. I think the consumers today are totally different to the consumers that I experienced in Colombia when I came in 1980. Technology is opening the chance to people to have different ways to buy, to sell, and to look for products. Commodities will continue to grow, and the trend for commodities and natural resources to continue to grow will be higher. I think countries as China will require resources, and a country like Colombia, I know we have criticized and we are all have suffered the fact that oil became the most important generator of growth for the country for, for many years, and we suffered in the last four years the decay on oil prices. But I think we are fortunate in Colombia to have not only oil, but to have also other natural resources that will generate growth for the country in addition to other companies that can grow. And I think one of the main things that we have in Latin America, and I think in Colombia, is agriculture and food. I think we have water. Water is something that many countries are desperate to find. Colombia has water, has agriculture, has food. And that is going to give us the capacity to compete in a world in the 2040 and 2050. If entrepreneurs, if people such as each one of you can come back to Colombia and can in one way or another build companies that can hopefully be successful in any one of these fields. Just to finalize the presentation, I want to give you a, a small number to let you think about really the challenges that we have, not only as Colombians ahead, but, but as, as citizens of Colombia for the future. In the past 50 years, GDP growth in Colombia has been approximately 4.2%. Of that 4.2%, 1% has come from productivity and 3.1, 3.2% has come from employment growth. That was the base in which our country grew. We had a high population growth. It was close to 3% at some point. Today we are close to just 1%. The Colombia of 2040 will not be like I said before when I came to Colombia to go from 27 million to 50 million. It will be a country that probably will be 60 million or 62 million people at that rate of growth. And what that will require will be a complete change in running companies, in running the government, in running the country, to be able to provide growth and to be able to provide employment and to be able to provide a better standard of living for every Colombian of those 50 million that we are there, which will become 62 million. If we don't do nothing, the growth will only be 2.1%. 1% will come from employment growth and 1% from productivity. So I think that the key of the success of a country like Colombia and leaders like you, like me, who really are concerned not only of today, but of the future, we need to think of how we can build three times the productivity growth that we have today in order to be able to sustain rates at four to 5% of GDP that can allow Colombia to really be in 2040 and 2050 when one of you can come here to this conference and talk about Colombia of the 2080 and can proudly say we are one of the top countries in the world. Muchísimas gracias. Estoy abierto para cualquier tipo de pregunta. But I only have to say one thing to you. When I was here 40 years ago, graduating, you always have doubts, you have concerns. I have my daughter at Harvard Business School, coincidentally. And um, I always think uh, those doubts and those concerns, I can tell you I'm an optimist. Colombia is a great country. Try to come back. The sooner, the better. We need everyone to support the growth of the economy, the growth of our universities, the growth of our hospitals, the growth of our government. And uh, by being optimist and by dreaming, like I said, that I did uh, 40 years ago, we will all make a better country.
Ahora, ahora en español, si hay alguna pregunta, con, con mucho gusto. Me da pena, pena que hablen en inglés, pero había escrito en inglés pensando que era una audiencia que no hablaba español. Por favor. Mi nombre es Mayra Vendaño. Yo me gradué de, de Harvard en el 2015. Tengo un doctorado en Teología de Temas. Ahorita trabajo como asociado en Fondo de Inversión en Ciencia. Y básicamente por eso quería preguntarte, ahora que, o sea, lo que mencionaste, todas las tendencias que están pasando a la población en términos de que están migrando a las principales ciudades, eso abre muchas oportunidades en agricultura. Eh, ¿Cómo, para que, o sea, para que pasen esas, como esas nuevas tecnologías, tiene que haber inversión de alto riesgo? Pero en Colombia vemos que no hay. Es una, o sea, ¿Tú qué piensas cómo podríamos incrementar, o sea, en términos de los inversores, también para que los emprendedores puedan empezar a generar nuevas, nuevas tecnologías, cómo se incrementa esa probabilidad de que los inversores apoyen eh, esas tecnologías de alto riesgo. Eso es como la primera, tengo otra, otra que es, o sea, una de las formas puede ser empezar a traer capital de afuera, también para sostener este tipo de inversiones, cómo incentivamos eso, eh, aparte de, pues de, 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 de reformas tributarias que obviamente serían eh, lo óptimo. No, mira, yo creo que es el conjunto de muchas cosas, y, y no te voy a decir que es una u otra porque, porque vale en talla por error. Yo creo que el campo, sin lugar a duda, y la agricultura es uno de los grandes pilares del futuro de Colombia. Para darte una idea, nosotros estamos ahora en el Paraguay. Tenemos un banco en el Paraguay. Y, y, y no imagina, Paraguay, Paraguay es el cuarto país productor de soybeans del mundo. Y yo que he tenido la oportunidad de estar allá cinco años, he visto el crecimiento del negocio de soya. Eh, no solamente a nivel de crecimiento de producción, sino a nivel de eficiencia de producción. Nuevas tecnologías, que es lo que tú estás planteando. Pero en Colombia necesitamos lo más importante, confianza. En el caso mío, en 1994, cuando compré el Banco de Colombia, fui a buscar la plata para comprarlo, porque no tenía ni cinco centavos para hacerlo. Y fui alrededor del mundo, viajé, conseguí 800, 87 institutional investors y lo logramos comprar. Yo les di confianza, les mostré un camino, camino que lo podemos hacer y lo logré. Yo creo que si en Colombia buscamos la inversión extranjera, Buscamos la inversión extranjera hacia el sector de la agricultura. Yo creo que va a haber esa oportunidad. Ahora, creo que si la economía empieza a crecer, o sea, un país, un país está creciendo al 1.8, como ha pasado el año pasado, si logramos pasar a 4, 5, 6%, que yo personalmente creo lo vamos a lograr en los 3, 3 a 5 años próximos, vas a ver de nuevo, digamos, la capacidad de fondos de inversión, venture capitals, que de por sí están en Colombia, dando el tema de la agricultura. Ahora, eh, hay casos como, por ejemplo, el caso de Perú, donde tengo, digamos, algún conocimiento, porque tenemos una operación bancaria allá. Perú hoy en día produce 6 billones de dólares de frutas y vegetales. Es una cosa astronómica. Hace 20 años no existía. Entonces, cuando tú hablas con las personas en Perú, estudiantes como tú y muchos empresarios jóvenes que haya, o sea, han entrado, han, han empezado, hay, y hay un sistema que ha permitido, digamos, a través ya de la, la banca, o de banca estatal, de ir financiando proyectos y, y he conocido varios casos de pequeñas eh, fincas que han ido creciendo y han desarrollado, digamos, algo, digamos, con tecnología y que ha sido exitoso en, en algunos de los productos agrícolas, tanto como frutas como vegetales. Entonces, yo creo que en Colombia lo que necesitamos es confianza. Si logramos transformar el país a que haya confianza internacional de invertir, si le damos al país la capacidad a los empresarios de ser globales, no solo regionales, regionales, sino globales. Eso va a jalar un montón de empresas, un montón de compañías que van a permitir lograr pues ese, esa oportunidad para, para entrepreneurs como tú y como era yo. Y, eh, una de las principales razones, la razón por la que pude estudiar es por Jaime y por el fellowship, así que mil gracias. De verdad que es <ríe> increíble. Así que eh, es un honor estar acá, conocerte. Y mm, mi pregunta es la siguiente. En, en términos de optimismo, eh, eso creo que ha servido para, en, en el momento en el que has impulsado la eficiencia de las, de las operaciones que has buscado, que has tenido, los bancos, etc. ¿Cuáles son esas tres cosas que buscas en la eficiencia de esas organizaciones? Y después, esos learnings, ¿cómo se pueden aplicar a un, a un país en términos de eficiencia? Yo creo que lo más importante en una compañía 
independiente de usar las mejores tecnologías y tener los productos que sean los mejores productos para el consumidor, es tener bases de costo baja. O sea, yo creo que las compañías que son eficientes y que cuidan el centavo y que cuidan el cost cost tienden a poder sobrevivir en épocas difíciles. Eh, yo, yo creo que eso es la clave, o sea, eh, a, a low cost operation es la clave para que compañías sean exitosas. Y esa es la clave en Microsoft, y es la clave en Google, y es la clave en muchas empresas. empresas en Colombia. Entonces, creo que costo es importante. importante. Eh, creo que el segundo es tratar de utilizar lo que más se pueda de tecnología. No importa en qué negocio estás, siempre hay algo que te puede hacer el negocio mejor por tecnología. La utilización de la tecnología es algo que no se usaba mucho y que hoy en día quien la utiliza tiene un competitive advantage. Y número tres, diría yo, yo oye al cliente. No importa qué hagas, si estás en el negocio de vender zapatos o vender eh, Google o vender computadores o lo que sea, oye al cliente. Y si estás en el gobierno, oye a las personas que están alrededor y los que estamos viviendo el país, porque eso hace la diferencia. A veces las personas tienden a no ir y yo creo que al no ir pierdes la oportunidad de tener ese self-mechanism de, de poder eh, uno recapacitar.